it ain't the left side or the right side, then it must be the fin side. Inside. It ain't the left side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode on the Fin Side here with Cat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Check out our merch store on thefinside.threadless.com. I'm Brian Cat NFL. Paul is fanatic underscore pick. Follow us both on Twitter. The Dolphins fall to 2-9 and nine on the year, falling 41-24 to 24 very convincingly to the Cleveland Browns. Jarvis Landry certainly got his revenge game with 10 catches, 148 yards, two touchdowns as he and Odell Beckham completely ate up the Browns or excuse me, the Dolphins secondary all throughout the game. You know, uh, I'm starting to think here, Paul, like I'm, I'm getting that feeling back a little bit where, you know, it, the Dolphins get crushed in the first two games of the year to the Ravens and the Patriots. They keep getting better, better and better. They win two games in a row. Now it seems like the they're completely swinging back the other way, and, and they're just getting worse and worse every week. To an extent, yes. I mean, there are a few players that shown through even today. I mean, I think Devontae Parker shown through late. Vince Beagle continued to play well. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not blaming this for the outcome of today when I say it. But – I will say it was probably some of the weirdest officiating I've ever seen in regards to pass interference calls. And that's in a year where it's, it's really under the microscope as well, because of the fact that it's now challengeable. Uh, The only people that are not allowed to challenge pass interference are the officials themselves, which inside of two minutes puts it in a very gray area where, the first time this year that I've seen a non-call of pass interference overturned was when the officials technically it, illegally, but based on the rules as they're written today, challenged themselves, went back and reviewed a play and gave the Browns the ball at the six yard line because they decided that they missed the pass interference call and went to the replay booth themselves. Very odd scenarios across the board with pass interference today. It was, regardless, Baker Mayfield goes 24 for 34, 327 yards, three touchdowns, one interception, and the interception was, frankly, a a lucky one by Ryan Lewis when the Dolphins were already down 28 to three. So, yeah, uh, as far as the officiating, there there were two definite iffy ones. One was a pass interference on Ken Crawley that I don't think was pass interference. I I thought it was a good play by him. And the one that was reversed was on Nick Needham that that gave the the Browns, like you said, the ball at the six yard line. But regardless, it, it, Dolphins, uh, it, it it wasn't pretty here because the Browns were up twenty one to nothing. You know what? Eleven with eleven minutes left in the second quarter, and that was pretty much it. The Dolphins scored a touchdown um, in the third quarter. I, I, you know, actually, I will give the Dolphins credit for this. They did fight back a little bit because. It was 28 nothing at one point, and by the end of the third quarter, um, it's 28-17 Browns, and the Browns have the ball deep in their own territory, and it's third down, and they end up getting the first down, and then they just keep chugging, chugging along from that point. But in that third quarter, it started to look like the Dolphins were starting to p- put a couple of drives together. Bengals were going to win, and yeah, didn't really turn out that way. The the Browns hit the accelerator again from there. I mean, there were some moments coverage-wise in this game, too, where the defensive alignment definitely seemed to confuse the Browns, at least temporarily. Um, again, there, there was a lot to build off of in this one, but th- this was a game where Miami just got outmatched. And you look at, you know, and not to make excuses, but you look at, Miami's walking wounded right now. They were already depleted roster. Now you've got Damian Howard on IR, Bobby McCain on IR, Rashad Jones on IR. Half the half the damn team is on IR at this point, and it's just getting ugly out there uh, as far as that goes. That's for sure. And yeah, I mean, when you've got Ryan Lewis and Nick Needham and Ken Crawley covering, you know, Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry, yeah, you're you're going to be outmatched, and there's not a lot that the coaching staff can do about that. Uh, I, I was hoping that they would have put up a little bit more of a fight 
here, but they they sure didn't. But in, in addition to that, with the defensive backs, just no pass rush whatsoever. And we say it time and time again, there's just not only no pass rush, but no ed, edge penetration either. Uh, you know, Nick Chubb, 21 carries, 106 yards, and he – you just never see it's just five yards, six yards, seven yards every time because you never see anybody bend the edge and get around the offensive tackle and cut into the backfield to take take one of these guys down for for a one or two yard loss. It's yeah, I mean Vince Beagle does its best, but that's just about it. I, I will say Christian Wilkins got a little bit of penetration today. I mean when when he hit them on that weird gimmick play and caused the fumble or, or the bad pitch or, or what have you, I mean, he planted, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head because I couldn't see his number because Christian Wilkins just buried the kid. Uh, there were a couple of plays I thought where, where Wilkins got through, but again, there's just not enough pressure that comes off that. Oh, actually I will take that back. Charles Harris did have another good pressure today. Uh, I don't have his exact snap count in front of me. But he did have a good pressure today. Yeah, he he plays better when he's playing from a power position. Um, he, he had half a sack. He split one with Davin Gotcha. Um, then again, uh, basically Charles Harris was uncovered on that play too, where he um, he ran around a running back. But hey, it still counts. So at least he's on the stat sheet here for the year. So taking a look here at the draft order, and it irritates me to look at this because uh, if if the season ended today. The Steelers would pick 20, or the, the Dolphins would pick 22nd and 25th with the picks that they got from the Texans and the Steelers. So this is definitely not a good week on the, the Minka Fitzpatrick Laramie Tunzel watch for that. But with the Dolphins loss, they actually moved from the fourth spot to the third spot because the Washington Redskins beat the Detroit Lions today. So now only ahead of the Dolphins are the Cincinnati Bengals who dropped to 0 and 11. I don't think that they're going to win a game this year as it as it looks more and more likely they go 0-16. Second is New York Giants, and that, that'll be an interesting game for the Dolphins in three weeks because if, if the Giants end up winning that game, then the Dolphins might have the second pick in the draft. And I think that's kind of where you want to be in this because it, with, with the Tua injury, you know, uh, it's starting to look more and more like Joe Burrow and Chase Young are going to be the clear-cut top two guys in this draft they are and i can't help but think when i look at the draft orders today i mean where it goes Bengals, giants dolphins uh the Bengals, if they take anyone other than burrow um are apparently tanking next season too and the giants i can't think of a player that's a better fit for the giants right now than chase young so Miami's got to get ahead of one of the two of them if they want one of those top two guys in this draft. I mean, third, fourth, they could definitely get a lot of use out of Andrew Thomas or Jeffrey Akuda, but really the two prizes right now given to his injury are Joe Burrow and Chase Young. Yeah, very well said. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do as far as the draft's concerned, but I, I can tell you right now, and I've, I've watched so much Oregon football over the last two years, just really wanting a reason to like Justin Herbert. And he, he, he did not have a very good game against Arizona state. Uh, they got upset. Herbert, I think was 20 for 36, 230 something yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. I, I just, I don't see the feet with this guy. Um, I, his ball placement's terrible. I, I completely am on board with the Ryan Tannehill comparisons because he, he, he's a big kid. He's got a great arm, but the, the vision, the ball placement, just not there. And man, oh man, if you put a Justin Herbert like prospect behind this Dolphins offensive line, even if they get a couple of players, I think it's going to be ugly. Did, did you say Tannehill? Is that is that that kid that uh, God seems to be leading the Titans on a hell of a, a, of a tear this year? Uh, I wish Miami could get a guy like him, but. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you that right. Ryan Tannehill is what I tweeted earlier. Ryan Tannehill is doing exactly what he did in 2016 when mm-hmm. Jay Ajayi went on his tear and, and Derrick Henry is going on his tear now. I mean, yeah, kudos to Tannehill and, and, and without question, he's done well for that team. There's no doubt about it, but 
then again, uh, what last last game the the Titans won, he completed 13 passes. How many did he complete today? I think 15. I mean, good for him. He's efficient, but when Derrick Henry has those games where he has 10 carries for 27 yards, let's see if Tannehill can – if they can win on the strength of his arm. I'm guessing that that won't happen, but we'll see. Look, all I am rooting for here is, is, is the Titans to continue this tear and somehow, some way, be part of that formula that knocks the damn Texans out of the playoffs. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen at this point. But again, I, I, I'm just rooting for anybody in the AFC South to win anything and everything at this point to help edge the Texans out of the playoffs. But I, I don't think it happens uh, after after what happened the other night. Yeah, right now, I'm just hoping for the Texans or the Steelers to to get out of the playoffs. I mean, I think I think expecting both of them to miss the playoffs at this point is very very ambitious. I I said from the beginning, I think the Texans will win 10 to 12 games. I still think that's going to happen here. So, but it, regardless, the Dolphins are going to have a lot of draft picks. I think where where they start to get into trouble is if they win two meaningless games at the end of the year against the Giants and against the Bengals, and now they're picking fourth or fifth in the draft, and that that's where that's going to be tough to swallow at that point. So we'll see. We'll 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 see what goes on. Let, let's go to the position by position break grades here, Paul. Ryan Fitzpatrick. 21 for 39, 214 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, one of the interceptions uh, was his fault, uh, threw it behind Mike Kosicki. The other one was, and it went off and doinked off the head of uh, Albert Wilson on, on, a, on a pass he should have caught. Not much blame, though, for Fitzpatrick. I mean, he was two for five for, for 12 yards, and the Dolphins were down 21 to nothing. So not a lot that you can say about that, but still – nothing that really jumps off the sheet either. So I'm just going to go ahead and give Ryan Fitzpatrick a straight C. I was worried for the way you were talking at first, you were going to be in that B range and we were going to have a hell of a gap. But a lot of the reasons you mentioned, I I have a C minus for Fitzpatrick. I think there was some poor decision-making at times. And while he may not have been the problem, he definitely wasn't a big part of the solution either. And, and that's where, where, especially at the quarterback position, you need to be part of the solution when things are getting rough. And I, I don't feel like he was today. I think there were a lot of times he wasn't on the same page as his wide receivers. I think there were a few times where he held the ball far too long and not just due to the coverage. So I can't give him anything above a C-. minus, and I'm, I might be being a little bit generous here just because – he wasn't the problem today, but he, he wasn't the solution. Uh, running back, another week, another terrible performance from Kalen Balaj. Two Wildcat plays today. from And actually, uh, on those two plays, he had uh, three three yards and four yards. So if you take those out, then he's got, what, five carries for six yards? Um, so, But he finishes the day seven carries, 13 yards, 1.9 yards a carry. So his yards per carry on the year remains at 1.9. Um, it's it's getting tough for this kid. I mean, I I'm I don't quite understand why Patrick Laird is not in there from the beginning at this point. Uh, he had three carries for 20 yards. Uh, Miles Gaskin had four carries for 10. Um, overall, the the Dolphins are going to have to get a different running back after this year. Luckily, it should be a deep NFL draft class. I I'm looking at that late second, early third round pick where there should be a lot of value at that spot, but still not good enough at the running back spot. Going to give it a D minus. Yeah, there were a couple of things that I really want to point out today. Uh, Balazs was absolute trash, as we all know. Um, it, it's If there's an ineffective play, it's probably Balazs. And the thing that pissed me off the most with Balazs today was one of those wildcat plays where he pulled up to throw and just, it almost looked like Dak Prescott doing hip warm-ups before a game. And, and the worst part about that entire situation was he couldn't find a receiver open. When Devontae Parker, all six foot too much of him, was standing eight feet away in the direction he eventually ran, behind the defense, wide open, hands up, waiting for the damn ball. 
And yeah. instead, Kalen Balaj decides to tuck shoulder and run into the first guy he sees. And that tells me he has no business pulling up to pass the ball ever, ever. The other thing that killed me here, too, was I, I, I want to see a little bit more from Laird. He he had a couple of tough runs in the very few opportunities he had, including when he ran into the nearest jersey, at least he pushed the guy over and then fell forward, which is, you know, it, it's simple math as far as running backs go. If you get three yards per carry, every carry, you will get first downs and you can just march right down the damn field. It's It's like the easiest math in football. The other thing I had was Miles Gaskin when they were in that, that quick drill. He had a play where he thought he was down, and basically they wound up blowing, blowing him down because he just kind of like hung out. And then when the guy ran up to tackle him, everybody was just like, oh, shit, uh, okay, end of play, uh, which was odd to me too. I don't like how much we've seen these running backs look like a deer in a headlights so far this year at all. So D minus from me as well. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought up that Wildcat play because, yeah, Devontae Parker was open. And if Kalen Balazs had just run straight forward from the beginning, uh, I, I, I even think Kalen Balazs would have got through the hole and 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 not not found a way to get to get stonewalled there. So, yeah, it's it's becoming embarrassing for this guy. I, I just I flat out hope he's not on the team next year. Uh, receivers and tight ends, I'll throw it back to you. I am absolutely mystified, not just that Wildcat play, but that Miami didn't find a way to get Devontae Parker involved earlier in the game. You could see it was a whole different offense when they started getting Devontae Parker involved, and that felt like it was only after Albert Wilson and Jakeem Grant went down with injuries. And I don't get it because Devontae Parker, as soon as they started getting him involved, was all over the damn field, made smart decisions. I remember he caught one of those, those passes short of the sticks. And if he took the, the time to turn around, wouldn't have made the first down and instead glanced over his shoulder and kind of backpedaled and fell backwards to make sure he got the first down, which was a more aware play that, from Devontae Parker than I've seen the entire time we've been waiting for Devontae Parker to develop. He's always had the physical tools, but he hasn't had the effort and mental makeup when he's been out there on the field. And, and this is a far different Devontae Parker that we're seeing this year. I mean, I'd be okay with them extending him this offseason, even with a year remaining, just to be able to play cap number games to get some of his salary front-loaded. I, I, this Devontae Parker, what this coaching staff gets out of him, I want to see here for a long time. But they need to get him involved. Albert Wilson, however... He's got some special ability, but man, I, I just watching that ball bounce off his hands, off his helmet, and go flying up in the air, absolutely ridiculous. He just had a rough, rough day, and he hasn't shown that he's the same player he was before he got hurt, and then he got hurt again. So uh, I'm torn there. I did like Mike Gasicki's first touchdown, even though that was a hell of a celebration for being down by a lot of points. It was. For the receivers. What's your grade? A C. Yeah, I, I'm right there with I, – I had a C written down myself. Uh, yeah, D Devontae Parker, he is on pace for now. Uh, f for the season, he is on pace right now for 67 catches, 1,011 yards, and six touchdowns. We, we need to find some bright spots here with this team, and that's certainly one of them. Um, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, Alan Hearns got four catches for 42 yards, matched up with Denzel Ward all game. I, I was expecting him to get completely wiped out. I probably like Hearns more than you do, and uh, you yep. know he had a he had a terrible play last week that that basically completely turned it stopped any momentum in the Bills' loss. But I, you know, I. When I look at Hearns, too, I, you know, I remind people that this guy back in 2015 had 1,000 yards with Blake Bortles at quarterback and, and re-signed a, a long deal. And then he got hurt with the Jaguars, got hurt with the Cowboys. I, I certainly like him more than Albert Wilson, I'll tell you that. Albert Wilson, just every time he's on the field, I, I just don't see it. I mean, that that injury must have really 
really hurt him because he does not look anywhere near as explosive as he did. Um, six catches, 33 yards, um, and had that interception charged to Fitzpatrick just bang off his helmet. And he also had another fumble, too, that luckily went out of bounds. So, yeah, he's somebody I'm looking forward to basically getting the ax in the offseason. So uh, I'm also going to go with a C. The offensive line, um, not one of the worst games from them, but still not not all that great, too. And I, I've, I've got to admit that on the interior line, I've got a little more work to do um, uh, when the All-22 comes out. But uh, Jesse Davis, I, I know, got, got beat several times at right tackle. Big surprise. Uh, they, they were going up against a unit that was depleted by injuries. Miles Garrett didn't play. We know why. Larry Ogunjobi didn't play. Olivier Vernon was also hurt, so he didn't get – the, that comeback game. Uh, Brian Cox Jr. got a lot of penetration today, and you know it was interesting to see that against his his dad's old team. But um, I, I in the first couple drives of the game, they certainly weren't protecting Fitzpatrick very well, and it seems that Fitzpatrick gets rid of the ball so quickly that I think that masks a lot of problems too. But and. As far as the off as run blocking, obviously Cam Blige, seven carries, thirteen yards. I think a better running back would have got much more than that. But you know, I so I'm I'm just going to go ahead and give the offensive line a C minus. I'm going to give him a D plus. I mean, when you're going up against three out of four backups, you know, you take you take the name recognition away for Brian Cox Jr. You're going against three out of four backups and then Sheldon Richardson. I don't care for a makeshift offensive line. You should be able to hold your own, and, and they sure didn't. I mean, did Ryan Fitzpatrick hold the ball a little too long at times today? Yes. Did Miami's receivers struggle to get open at times today? Yes. Was Caleb Balazs the running back that's not going to average anything? Yes. But at the same time, your, five, your starting five on the offensive line are going up against – three backups uh, on that D-line, along with a D-line rotation that, that gets you even deeper into their backup, uh, you know, pulling folks off the shelf. And it's just not good enough. It's just not good enough. I really hope Miami does invest in this O-line this offseason. It doesn't have to be the biggest names on the market, but they've got the cap space to make an impact on this offensive line and not cripple themselves heading into the draft where they have to spend – just an, an absolute dearth of this bounty of picks on the O-line. I, Hopefully still, Miami's able to do that. I'm still staying with you, you need to get at least two offensive linemen in this offseason. And it's it's a very deep year in free agency as it's shaping up right yeah. now. Hopefully a, a Brandon Scherf or Jack Conklin uh, it actually hit the market so that the Dolphins can get get two of these types of players. It's also, as far as offensive tackle, one of the deepest offensive tackle classes at this point I've ever seen. So hope is on the way, and I, you know, I, I'm hoping they can take the other resources they have and, and and force them into center, right guard, and and depth because you know, look, Evan Bame, Jesse Davis. I, when they're the best offensive linemen on your team, you've, you've certainly got major problems. Um, but if you've got them as depth players or you've got them manning one spot and they're fourth or fifth best lineman, maybe that's not so bad. So, But they've got a lot of work to do there. On the defensive side of the ball, it was a it was certainly a mess. I mean, it was, again, 21 nothing at the beginning of the second quarter, and then that was pretty much it from there. They The defense picked it up a little bit after that, um, until really the fourth quarter when, when the Browns started to run away with it. But uh, along the front seven, yeah, same thing. Christian Wilkins, Devin Gotcha, they're, they're good players, but their their impact is, is pretty minimal. They're, they're not going to get a lot of sacks. They're not going to get a lot of tackles for loss, but that's not really their job either. But uh, you look at uh, Nick Chubb goes over the century mark, and between Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, 29 carries, 143 yards, it seemed like they got five yards of carry whenever they wanted it. Um, just one sack from the Dolphins, like we said, split between Gotcha and, and Charles Harris. Um, at linebacker, I thought Jerome Baker had a pretty pretty good game. He actually had an interception that was called back. 
uh, too, which would, which was a shame. I was looking for him to get on the stat sheet there. Raekwon McMillan had his usual solid game too, but you know, 143 yards from the top two running backs, just one sack, no penetration. It, it was to me the biggest problem in the game here. So I'm going to go ahead and give this front seven a D. I've got to sit right there with you as well on the D. It's I thought about a D plus. I'm with you on Baker. They they did they did get on the sack total today with that big one sack along the D front. I don't have an issue with Gotchow. Uh I, I thought he played well. I, I don't have an issue with Christian Wilkins or Vince Beagle, but it, John Jenkins was up and down and all over the map. <clears throat> um yeah, you know, it, it, it's not great what you see from outside of those folks. And as we talked about earlier, there's no penetration from the knee line uh, most of the time. And, and that just allows other teams to pick you apart. And then they really get to destroy you with the run from that point. So, yeah, we we need to see a little bit invested. Chase Young would look awful good in Aqua. That's all I'm going to say there. Yeah, that, that's for sure. And somebody like that would also alleviate a, a lot of other big needs on this team, too. So we'll we'll see. That's that's a talk uh, subject for another day. I'm going to throw it back to you on uh, for defensive backs. This was a tough one to judge today. I, I, I thought that Nick Needham played well. Um, I know he got beat a few times. I know Landry had, like, that beautiful catch reaching over his head. <clears throat> but overall, it's it looked like there were times where there were blown coverages and Needham tried to make it up. Um, and there, there were just way too many DPIs, even if they were phantom ones. I did like what I saw from Eric Rowe, uh, and, and all of these kids had their moments, but over, it just wasn't good enough. It just wasn't good enough when you're letting Baker Mayfield, Mayfield throw for 327 yards. Uh I'll go with a C minus for the secondary. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna stay with my my D, the same I gave the front seven. You know, again, if we're judging on effort, I, I'd grade it higher. And look, they they are what they are. A lot of these defensive backs. I mean, you know, it, I, I was I was disappointed. Nick Needham was not up to the challenge today. Um, you know, a lot of two touchdowns, but he did fight back and good for him. He, he got better as the game went along. I I think this is somebody who's going to be a really good backup cornerback for the Dolphins. Um, another thing, too, is that if the Dolphins are going to play man-to-man as much as they are, and I hope they do moving forward because, you know, we, we saw so much of this zone crap for the last 10 years where just if you don't get to the quarterback, you've got players wide open on third down every time. I'm glad they're not doing that anymore. But given that, they also really need to be very good at defensive back. Um in 2020 and beyond they're going to get Xavier and Howard back but a Byron Jones or a James Bradbury or a Jeffrey Akuda might be needed here too um at safety yeah I mean I I really hope they keep Eric Rowe at strong safety and start him next year because that that's he he's he's a solid player back there and I think that's a a perfect role for him he's 6'1 205 pounds uh, he's just a, a step slow for the cornerback position but I I think he's in a He's more at home there at strong safety. I thought Ken Crawley had a good game too, and and I think he's had a couple of good games. He certainly looks the part. I was very surprised the Saints cut him. Um, he had a pass interference call on him here, and I thought it was a bogus call. Uh, and it, it, it certainly the flag should not have been thrown on that play. But still, 24 for 34, 300 plus yards, three touchdowns. Can't give him any higher than a D. Um, Throw it back to you here on special teams. Uh, special teams was intriguing to say the least today. Um, it was nice seeing the Colonel continue to be perfect, but outside of that, I, I wasn't hugely enamored with the return game. Uh, that fake punt was a thing of stupidity against arguably one of the better special teams groups out there. And no one was taken by surprise at a point where it was make or break. And unfortunately, it was break on that one. And that just helped put Miami in an early hole they couldn't get out of. So that said, 
I'll, I'll go with a, a C for this unit only because there really wasn't enough to work with on this one. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go with I guess a C plus. I mean, uh, for a lot of the reasons you said there. I mean, Jakeem Grant went down. Uh, Marcus Shales was returning punts and. Uh, he, look, he, can't, he he doesn't fumble the ball. That's the biggest compliment I could give him. Um, knock on wood now. Um, Jason Sanders hit his field goal. He hit his extra points. Um, Matt Hawk, I, I thought there were – he didn't have his classic Matt Hawk shanks three punts game that we haven't seen a lot of this year. But I, I also thought that there were a lot of times where the Dolphins are punting from the 35 or the 40, and, you, you know, you, you could have really bombed the ball back there and they're starting at their 10 or their 15, and instead they're starting at their 30. So, yeah, I can't give any higher than a C+. Um, so who is your, Paul, your player of the game, and uh, who are you putting on the Coke bus for the, your, your disappointing player of the game? I'm going to give Devontae Parker my player of the game for this one. I know he didn't get as many opportunities as he should have, but he still continued to shine. Damn near put up 100 yards, even though he, he really wasn't, given many opportunities so uh, I can give Devontae Parker that which again you told me this four months ago I would have laughed and laughed and laughed but hey Parker's earned it for me at this point as far as my coke bus player of the game god there's so many options to choose from yeah, I'm gonna to have to come back to me on this one. I need to I need to give it a little more thought because I'm I'm bouncing about four people around in my head on the, on this game. Yeah, I'm gonna say yeah, it's it's hard for me to pick player of the game other than Devontae Parker, but I, I'll I'll give it to Mike Gesicki. I mean, good, good for him for getting his first touchdown. I mean, it's pretty sad we're giving a giving a player of the game here for three catches for 28 yards, but he was also open a couple other times too, and uh, I I thought Fitzpatrick did not hit him. So uh, good that he's getting better and better throughout the year. And, you know, I think Parker and Gesicki do project as starters here for next year. Uh, we can spend that money at, at other positions here. Uh, Cook Bus player of the game, I, I've got to give it to Nick Needham. I mean, two touchdowns allowed early. And I'm, I'm, I, I really wanted him to step up and respond to the challenge and, and look like a starting caliber player against Pro Bowl caliber receivers and, and Odell Beckham and, and Jarvis Landry. That didn't happen. Jarvis Landry, 10 catches, 148 yards. A lot of those were off Nick Needham. Not all of them, but but many of them were. So um, I'll throw it back to you there. Now that you've had a few minutes, who's yours? Yeah, I should have I should have just went with this right off the rip. Kalen Balazs, easily for me. And I know, I know that's, you know, picking on the wounded here, but you look at everything he did. And when you look at that wildcat play today where he should have thrown the ball and had Devonte Parker wide open or could have taken off early and gotten the first down or one of a million other options that didn't involve just run into another player. And he took none of those. And it, you look at the rest of the way and he didn't do anything else to enamor himself with his under 1.9 yards per carry for this one. So Caleb Balazs can jump on that Coke bus. I mean, he's the true definition of what started the Coke bus for us. And, you know, he, he's basically not coming off the field unless somebody else uh, plants something in his vehicle at this point, <laughs> by, by all accounts. So yeah, he's, he's, he's like the penultimate definition of Coke bus player. I'm with you on that. Uh, that will do it for our breakdown of the Miami Dolphins 41 to 24 loss to the Cleveland Browns. I am Brian Cat NFL on Twitter. Paul is fanatic underscore pick. You can follow both of us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. We will be here previewing and reviewing the games throughout the rest of the year. Come rain or shine, we're going to be with you throughout the whole offseason when we hit free agency in the draft as well. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the thin side. So, D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the thin side. Thin side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side, side, and it must be the thin side. Left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about.